So, hey, Simon, welcome to the show. Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm so looking forward to this session because、mm, career switch to coding is just something I really I wish I could have、uh, when I career transition into technology. So,、uh, maybe perhaps we can start off this、uh, session with this question.、Uh, the promise of career switch to coding is converting newly minted coding skills into a dream career. With upvote one hundred and sixty-two at all times. So to set the scene, since when is coding your have your、uh, your hobby? How did you self-taught yourself coding? Yeah, so I had three failed attempts at learning to code. Once when I was eleven, and the sum total of that effort was to brick my parents' computer. So that didn't go very well. Uh, then the next attempt was a few years later. I think I was fourteen or fifteen. Managed to not break the computer this time, but didn't really get anywhere. I, I bought a book. I think it was Sam's Teach Yourself to Code in Twenty Four Days or something. Didn't get very far with it.、Uh, the next time was on my degree.、Uh, I did a bachelor's in electrical and electronic engineering, and they tried to teach us C on that course.、Mm. I did the bare minimum possible. To pass those exams,、uh, didn't enjoy programming at all, and then it got to my PhD, also in electrical engineering, and I realised actually I need to learn how to code because it's going to make my PhD a lot easier. So I self-taught in two thousand and ten ish, something around that time. So I I took an online course which is still running and is still fantastic called CS50 CS50 dot net. It is the Harvard、uh, University Introduction to Computer Science. I worked through those problem sets. I watched the videos on iTunes U. I worked at how to get their helper libraries and files working, and it was way less、uh, well streamlined than it is now. Now it's CS50 is like a well-oiled machine. Now it's really good, but back then it was very, very kind of rusty. So, but it was always my hobby. It was it was never like my thing that I was doing. It was a tool. To, it was a means to an end. I was solving little problems in my PhD, and I was writing little things on the side while running a business that I'd founded. So I, I finished my PhD, set up a manufacturing and product based business here in the UK,、mm. and was writing code as a hobby, basically little bits here and there, nothing, nothing too special. I got an app into the iOS App Store, but、um, yeah, it was it was just this kind of thing on the side that I did, and then. It got to 2019. My business,、um, I had to close the doors on that after eight years. Unfortunately, we had a had a bad sales season due to some weather here in the UK. So we closed those doors, and after applying for 200、mm. jobs over the summer, I realised that it was probably time to do a better job at working out how to be a professional software developer. So, so there you go. That's that's kind of like the the. The run-up of learning to code, how I used it, you know, a little bit during those years, and then finally the forcing function to make me become a professional software developer. Got it. So it is the classic example how the people treated treat coding as a hobby and become a software developer. Any interesting little projects that you have been making or yeah. Maybe just what kind of problems did you solve for yourself? Yeah, so it started off in my PhD lab,、uh, just writing little scripts to process data uh, or uh, code to run on like little microcontrollers, that kind of thing. Very kind of like simple,、mm-hmm. just moving data around. Then when I was running the business,、uh, we'd raised venture capital, but we hadn't raised a lot of venture capital. We were a very seasonal business. We basically only made money during winter, and so we couldn't afford to hire lots of staff because come March, I'd have to let them all go. So we had our manufacturing guys, but I couldn't bring in a full time. Um, production person, like a supply chain manager or whatever. So I, my first iPhone app, my first proper big project, I suppose, was a、uh, Swift iOS stock manager application、okay. for small small factories. So you could input 
suppliers and deliveries and purchase orders and manufacturing runs and products and and it would give you like little stock warnings to say hey you just use 200 of this part and you've only got a thousand on hand and so you're going to run out of them so you might want to place a purchase order and, and that kind of thing it would the idea was so that i didn't have to spend three days a week at a massive Excel spreadsheet running all of these calculations to work out what were we going to run out of stock of this week. And it worked phenomenally well. I went from three days a week managing our stock ordering and production to like half a morning a week. Like it was fantastic. Oh, it was abs- yeah, it really, really worked. It worked incredibly well. And so that's the dream of coding and software is that you can automate away boring mm. jobs to allow you to spend time on the higher value stuff and it worked really well and i was like oh this coding thing is a bit like Mm. magic i had a big problem i spent oh crikey six months making that application in my spare time on and off and i I released it to the ios app store specifically to force me to cover off all the kind of rough edges so Mm. it's one thing to make a script that can just do what you want it to do It's a very different thing to make a full piece of software that is robust and reliable-ish and can be used by other people. So that was a really good sort of learning experience for me. And that was my first big-ish project. Uh, And I still sell to this day a few copies uh, every week. So it's paid up front. I think it's $1.99 or something like that. Um, it's it? been in the app store for 2015. So it's been in there for six years mm. and it still sells a, a handful of copies every week. People seem to like it. I've never done a version two. I've just, you know, first version, mm. out it went. People seem to like it and, and buy it. So, so yeah, that was my first, my first big, um, big project. And I've had a few other kind of smaller things, yeah, a bit of web design work for the business, um, little JavaScript, mm. um, like uh, experiences for customers on the website and what have you. Uh, but I think that stock manager one was my, my, my main one and where I kind of learned the most as well, I think, but I still wasn't, you know, a full-time professional software developer at that time. It was just me noodling away mm. on my own in the evenings, trying to mm. make my day job a bit better. Got it. So uh, it's basically something like uh, scratching your own itch and then, it is just uh, some kind of uh, labor of love uh, in coding and then you're just coding here and there to uh, solving, resolving your own problem. So what was your day job back then? What is that product and manufacturing company? What happened in 2018? What were you, or uh, why were you on the hunt for a job? And what types of jobs have you tried to apply for uh, that nearly 200 jobs? Mm, yeah, so I, off the back of my PhD, I was entering business plan competitions uh, with an idea for a central heating product. Um, and my eventual business partner was also entering the same business plan competitions for mm. a central heating product. And he was coming first and I was coming second. <laughs> so <laughs> we decided we're both working on the same area uh let's team up so we did we teamed up we did we did his idea um and this is very uk specific but in the uk we heat our houses with radiators we literally pump hot water around our houses into these big panel heater things full of hot water and they're good but they're not fantastic they could be a lot better and so we made a product called rad fan which is short for radiator fan and it was literally uh, a fan and some nice curved plastic that could go on top of your central heating radiators and redirect the flow of warm air out around mm. your room. It had the impact of making rooms about two degrees C warmer. As you can mm. tell, I have said that line <laughs> a few thousand <laughs> times in my life. <laughs> I haven't had to say it for a few years now, and it still comes right out because I said it so much. So, yeah, and, and as a result, because we only really sold when it was cold, we always we always made a sale on the UK's hottest day of the year, though. It was astounding. Every year, you'd get that one really hot day in the UK in July. And I'd see, I'd look at my phone in the morning. I'd be like, oh, somebody ordered a rad fan today. You know, we wouldn't sell anything in July and August at all. Apart from the hottest day of the year, we'd sell one. But then in the winter, we would sell, you know, we'd sell tens of thousands. 
and we were growing steadily each year and then it got to the winter of 2018 and 2019 um mm. and the uk had the warmest february on record mm. i got sunburn uh which is pretty rare in february in the uk it was 24 degrees again february mm. in the uk should average around seven degrees c something like that and dipping below zero on a regular basis and yeah middle of feb it was it was very very warm and february was our biggest month we should have done about 150 to 200 thousand pounds worth of revenue and we did twenty-five thousand pounds worth of revenue. So there was oh, a so shortfall. Of... Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we 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 had a shortfall of one hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds that month, which mm. was which was that was too much. We a lot of stock came back from Amazon. We had bills to pay, and mm. and we didn't have enough money to get through the summer and and what they call trade through. We couldn't trade through it. So we responsibly wrapped up the business. We didn't know anybody, any money. We paid all the bills. We went without salary for a bit to kind of make sure that we could wrap everything up. But it was pretty clear after eight years that you know, we weren't really in a position to continue that business. And, and you know, I, I grew that business with my business partner from the ground. You know, we had nothing. We started off with a lap two laptops in his kitchen. And then Did we had know? two, I think we had, we went through three factories. We employed 12 people um and we were selling like i say tens of thousands of units uh, every winter but mm. landed up ending so i started applying for jobs and the weird thing is when you run your own business like that you don't mm. really have any job experience sounds really strange to say that you run a business for eight years but you don't really have any job experience because i'd never had a job I'd done my PhD, which is not like a job at all, and mm. got that done in just under three years. And then I went into running my own thing. So I'd never been an employee. I'd run a factory. I'd raised venture capital. I'd done supply chain management. I'd done marketing. I'd done a lot of customer service. I made a website. I'd made two websites on Shopify. I'd got all of these things, all of these skills, Bless but it. most but exactly but most companies they don't want somebody that can do everything they want somebody that can do one or two things really mm. really well so i was applying for anything similar to what i'd done so it could have been a production manager head engineer um client representation quality control production management i, I was applying for everything and mm. everyone said your cv is really interesting but I just don't see where I can employ you. And I'm like, great, this is not good. <laughs> like not good at all. Like I apply, like I said, I applied for 200 jobs, a, a variety of different jobs. And, and I think at about job 150, I started applying for software jobs because I didn't know if I was actually any good at being a software engineer. Like I'd made applications myself. I'd got things in the app store. I'd solved my own problems. But I didn't know any software developers. I didn't know any software engineers. Like the only software engineers I'd interacted with were on Stack Overflow. Like that was it to me. Like I didn't <laughs> know anybody else that could write code. It was just me. Like it was, so I had no idea if I was any good or not. So I started speaking to some agencies um, and wasn't really getting very far because again, they, I looked peculiar to them. And eventually I got lucky. And mm. it's the biggest piece of advice that I give career switchers now is I got lucky and this was unintentional, but looking back and speaking to other career switchers who I've now met, this always works, which is find a company who is doing something similar to what your old career was. So mm. who are hiring software engineers. So I got incredibly lucky. I got hired. I applied, had a conversation. I got hired by a UK retailer and they uh was as peculiar as a company called bravissimo uh they make uh ladies lingerie that's what they make in the uk and um, you know nothing weird just normal lingerie retailer they have 25 stores around the country and they have a big e-commerce website and they're very much customer focused brand focused and mm. they needed a developer to work on their warehousing systems their stock management systems mm. and i had the experience of running Mm -hmm. a factory a warehouse and an e-commerce website and it's so when I, and I could code yeah as so, as so when i applied they were like 
this is amazing. You've basically done the job and you can code. I'm like, yeah, so they hired me like very quickly within a couple of days, got the job. And I've now spoken to other developers who've done the same thing. They maybe come from working in restaurants or working at an accountancy practice or working in medicine. They learn to code. They don't mm. get very far with job applications. Then they apply to something similar to what they were doing before. And suddenly mm. they've got job offers coming out of their ears because you have a previous career and that previous career is relevant and useful alongside your coding skills. And it makes mm. you, as I say in this book, it makes you a unicorn mm. developer because you so few people go through a computer science degree and, and get experience and then have other experience. Usually you're just a really good software developer, but you have to learn accountancy or you have to learn e-commerce or warehousing or whatever. Mm. But if you come in with that experience already, then you learn how to code, that ah, mm. you're away. So I was lucky that I stumbled on that, but it's a tried and tested approach that works really well that people don't necessarily think of doing. So that was what eventually changed the tide for me. And like I say, nearly 200 odd job applications later, it was summer 2019 was not fun, I can tell you. It was pretty depressing. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I would like to ask you, how did you exactly make up your mind and apply for that first ever coding job in that summer? Because mm, you were like an entrepreneur, you were doing everything else uh, by just by yourself uh, to running your own business. Uh, even though you have the coding skills, uh, mm, but it's like uh, it's part of your entrepreneurial job, but you make it as uh, your entire career from uh, that point forward. So yeah, why did you make up your mind at that point to apply for the first ever coding job in that particular summer? Yeah, how, so how it's a mental journey. Yeah, so it's it's interesting because with all of the talk of Silicon Valley and raising venture capital, and I can code, the obvious thing to do would be to make a startup, right? Would be to mm. code some amazing web app and whatever. The honest truth is, losing that business totally crushed me, completely crushed me. I mm. it took away all of my spark all of my confidence, all of my belief in my ability to make, even though it had been successful for eight years, we've been on the homepage of Amazon for like a whole year at one point, we had 4,000 product reviews, 4.4 stars oh, wow. on Amazon. Like it was, it was successful, but losing that business, also relocating to a different part of the country. My wife um, changed jobs to another end of the country. So we've been weekly commuting. Uh, five hours for a couple of years. So that relocation was tough. And I wasn't getting, I, I wasn't ready for a business. I couldn't, I didn't have the energy to go through it all again, to lose something that mm. I'd spent eight years building, to see it basically disappear in eight weeks because of factors outside our control. Mm. You know, no doubt we could have put mitigations in place earlier in the business life to prevent something like this happening but we were a very cash strapped business our venture capital funding wasn't particularly large and generous so i mean we raised less than a million pounds um probably less than a million dollars actually once i factor in the exchange rate so we didn't have you know oodles of money we hadn't raised money for four or five years mm -hmm. to lose all of that to tell my staff ah oh, telling my staff was the was hardest like thing i've ever done yeah. was horrible you know to sit down with my production manager and say i'm really sorry I, we, we'd gotten to the point where we could have somebody work for us all year round. It was amazing. You know, with a couple of summers, we'd had this guy, Darren. He was fantastic. And I had mm. to sit down with him and say, I'm really sorry. Mm. We need to shut the doors. Oh, and he wow. worked with us for five, I had staff for four or five years that kept coming back year after year. And they cried. You know, when you see a 50, you see a 55 year old oh, man. Did you cry? <laughs> From, from you, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, see, that's it. You, you, you see a 55 year old man mm. who's worked on manufacturing lines all his life in from Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK, tough city. Mm. You see him cry, mm. that that hits deep. That does. And we had a we had a, a going away party, and I had staff staff come in for the you know for a for a big kind of blowout party. And 
yeah, by the end of the night, we were all, yeah, we were all pretty cut up. And so, so yeah, it, it hurt, basically. It really hurt. And I wasn't Absolutely. ready to go through that again. Um, and so, so I, I felt like it was on me. My wife had supported me, you know, the whole time through. We made money, you know, I drew a salary from the business, but there's still times of uncertainty. There's the early days where you don't make much. And then there's a couple of months here and there where you have to skip paying yourself because you've got to pay suppliers or what have you. And my wife provided the stability. And so this was my mm. time to step up in the relationship and, and give some stability back. And so that's why I decided to go full time on one thing. And mm. what made me go for software engineering finally mm. was nothing else was working. <laughs> Maybe I am good enough. Maybe I am good enough to be a software developer. And that mm. was that was basically it was me saying, OK, we, we've got to find out. Am I good enough? Like, I think I'm good enough. Maybe I'm good enough. I, but I didn't know. Yeah. I had no idea at all. Absolutely none. It was just me making code and making fun little apps and solving my own problems. So, so in the end, it was a case of I've got to find some way to earn money. And the one type of job left I haven't applied for is being a developer. So I just applied. And yeah, like I say, I got this job as a full stack web developer at probably mm. the best place I could have done really for, for that point in my career. So, so yeah, that was, yeah. Losing a business is hard. <laughs> really hard. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> so it's like you tackle your emotional problem and face the reality and actually do something about uh, your career. And so what did you do to land that um, developer job? Can you walk us through that journey? Yeah. So what landed up working was speaking to a recruiter and mm. saying, this is my situation. So I found a job listing online. Mm. I didn't say what the company was. It just said software developer and it oh. had a range of skills. So I, and I looked, I, I found the recruiter's name and I rang him. I didn't email, I rang, I picked up the phone and I said, hi, my name is Simon. Mm. I've got a sl somewhat unique career background and I'm looking for a developer job. Do any, do you have any clients that you think would be interested in speaking to somebody with a non-traditional background? And he said, that's a really good question. Let me have a think about it. And he did. He thought on the line. He, he went silent and he said, yeah, do you know what? I think I've got a couple that would be open to it. Before mm -hmm. I put you forwards, can you send over your CV? Now, fortunately, I'd been applying. And so I had a CV ready. And specifically, I'd made a developer CV. So my developer CV was my name, my education, my top five skills, and then project, project, project. So any project that I'd got out in the wild, any project I'd made, any old project <laughs> that I had get, let, get into the detail yeah, a little bit. What what were those top five uh, skills? So there's, there was there was th so the skills. Um, uh, so I, I did. Um, what was it? What did I put? I, I think the the first line was experienced startup founder looking mm -hmm. for career switch. Mm -hmm. The next one was product and custom product and user focus. Mm. The next one was uh, operations, production, and process flow knowledge, God. and then then the last one was extensive iOS and JavaScript development skills, because God. I figured that my unique selling point as a developer was going to be the non-developer skills, because anybody bringing me in would know that. Mm. I have other skills and then let's see where the technical skills are from there. Mm. And then the projects, any project that I'd made that was up online that had a website, I'd put the name of it, put a link, and then I'd say one sentence on what the project was. So small factory management, stock management and production management application mm. built in. And then I would list Swift, mm. iOS, UI kit. And then the next bullet point, because I made a back end for it as well, was MySQL and PHP. Yes, I had PHP on my CV and no one cared. Um, and then the last thing was, I think oh. the number of downloads it had had, which was like 5,000 at this point or something. No, I couldn't do as many of that. Um, couple, of, couple of thousand, whatever. So I had the number of downloads. And then the next project was the same, was a website I had that I'd actually retired the project. Uh, it wasn't online anymore. I'd even, I'd even let the domain name lapse as well. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, no, I might need this domain name back. Unfortunately, nobody had bought it. 
And so I bought the domain name back and brought the project back to life. And it's called onequestion.com, uh, O-N-E-Q-S-T-N.com. It's still live. Uh, and it's a single question survey website where you can post mm. one question with multiple options. You don't need an account. You can you can like add your details if you want. And then you can share the link with anybody, you know, however many people. Um, and again, I was like single question account the survey app. Um, made in Code Igniter, PHP, jQuery, mm. etc. Um, and the number of monthly visits that it gets, and for whatever reason, that website actually gets like a few thousand visits a month. Um, mm. And that's what. I, and, and then I put my work experience at, at mm. the bottom with my only the things that were related to the job, which was like any code I'd written, development, what have you. But my work experience was on the second page, I think. And then my education was below that. And mm. then finally was just like hobbies and interests. Um, so I really put the projects mm. right at the top. The first, basically the first thing was re re small released usable projects. They are my three criteria that I tell mm. people that your projects need to be. They need to be, they need to be small so that you can finish them, right? You want it to be mm. feature complete. It needs to be up working somewhere so that somebody can go to a URL or go to an app store and download it or use it. Um, and it needs to be it needs to be complete. You, you need you need to have actually finished something that somebody can feel some value. So you know, small, functional, and complete. That is what your projects need to be. They don't need to be unique, big. To be honest, my stock application app I think is too big for a portfolio side project. I made it big because I needed it to be big, but really mm. one question is a much better single portfolio project because it solves one thing, does it well, and you can use it. So um, so yeah, that's that they were the, I think, was there one more? Uh, I think I made a, a photography app for a friend of mine just for like managing his, like working out how much he should charge as a photographer and like how much his kit costs to replace every few years. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I, I put that on there as well. Um, Redwood app, that's called. Um, so, so yeah, that was, that was what I put on my CV. I sent it over to mm. the recruiter and then the recruiter said, yeah, do you know what? I, I think a couple mm. of my clients would be interested in speaking to you. And what was amazing about that is when you speak to a recruiter, they have hundreds of clients. So when you speak to a, a recruiter and you say, mm. this is me, you're not applying to one job. You're applying to potentially 20, Multiple 30, 40, 100. Jobs. Exactly. And if they're a good recruiter, they'll even know the people who aren't hiring actively but might still be interested in you because of your unique background, right? If you're a, I don't know, if you're an ex delivery driver for TNT or FedEx and you learn to code and then you want to apply to a you know you start applying for developer jobs and you speak to a recruiter and a recruiter's like hmm none of my current clients are looking for a developer with your background but last year FedEx or um GeoPost or some intermediary that sorts out postage costs between eBay and couriers, they were hiring last year. Well, guess what he's going to do? He's, that <laughs> recruiter is going to pick up the phone, is going to speak to speak to their, their friend and say, uh, uh, that client, and say, I've got this CV that's come through. I know you're not actively hiring, but boy, the skill set really fits with what you're doing. So that is the magic of uh... recruiting. That, that was what I benefited from. So, so yeah, I, and then I, 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 I got referred to the company and we went through the typical hiring process at that point. And they never tested my coding skills, but they did give me a little general knowledge quiz on coding. So they asked me like, what's a closure and what does plus plus mean? And, and fairly simple, basic stuff because for this particular employer, they struggled to hire developers. And mm. so they are more than willing to train on the job if they need to. And so they don't set the barriers. They, they, they hire much more for culture fit. Like I spend a lot more time being asked about my personality, how I react to criticism, how I do time management, how do I speak to people. I got asked way more about that stuff than I ever did about um, mm. the actual raw coding ability because they could see my projects online. All they had to do was go to stock management 
app.com and onequestion.com and they could see what I made. So they didn't mm. need to test my, my skills really. Oh, so um, they didn't really test your coding skills, but uh, not, not at all. So uh, to actually apply your coding skills is like uh, the first day on your job or, oh, oh, amazing. Uh, that's good to know. So uh, other than this job, uh, what are those uh, 11 companies that you have interviewed. Can you talk about it a little bit? Are they very- Absolutely. From yeah, Discord. Yeah, so over the last two years, I have, because of the pandemic, because I was working for a retailer that got hit very hard by COVID, I was actively looking for work uh, through 2020. Yeah. And I then never really stopped interviewing because the next company I went to had a, they got acquired very soon after I joined, even though they were 17 years old as a company, they got acquired very soon after I joined. And so I could kind of see that things might change. A uh, very small company. And I was, so I kept interviewing. So yeah, over the last two years, mm -hmm. I think I've interviewed, yeah, with 11 companies and had 10 job offers, basically. And oh, wow. they have been, they've been a variety of companies and it, and it's purely been because of my approach has changed to how I treat a job search. So I don't, I don't start engaging with a company unless I actually think I have something unique to offer them because of my skills and my background. So I have only applied to one unicorn. Uh, right. and that was the one that I didn't get the offer from, although I did go through all five rounds of interviews and i was told that the reason i didn't get that role was because i didn't solve conway's game of life as elegantly as the interviewer would have liked but the other three the other two coding tests i did absolutely fine in and i'd never seen conway's game of life before apparently it's a well-known computer science problem but I don't have a computer science degree, so I've never had to solve Conway's Game of Life. So the first time I saw Conway's Game of Life was in a four, was in a forty five minute live coding test. Mm. Uh, I managed to solve it, and it wasn't great. And I said that at the end that it wasn't fantastic, it wasn't the best solution, and I would want to refactor. Um, and yeah, apparently that that was the reason. And the recruiter said the other uh, interviewers thought you did fantastic on theirs, but mm. unfortunately, the way that big tech works is one person can kibosh your whole uh interview process yeah you can get five yeses one no guess what you're not getting the job mm. and that's what makes applying for big tech so hard and demoralizing and i actively recommend that career switchers do not apply to traditional mm. technology firms instead apply to the types of firms that the other 10 companies I've applied for are. So I have spoken to data science consultancy. I worked for a data science consultancy as a web developer. I've mm. applied to a company, a small company making wireless sensor nodes. Uh, my background in electronics is very relevant to wireless sensor nodes. Very small mm. company though, 20 people. Um, I uh, interviewed with a company who were rewriting large scale um, warehouse applications. Mm. very relevant to what i used to do basically they've all been different and they've all co they've all tested in slightly different ways so mm. one company i had to do a coding test but it was fix an angular app on shared mm. video and so the angular app was broken it was angular, sub two. angular 2 so mm. it was broken and i had to fix it and so yeah. we did it as a shared example and i basically he the the interviewer got to see my debugging skills got to see my general understanding of angular was mm. more than happy for me to google things wanted to see what type of things i googled for if i needed to google i've also just had i think i've had three offers where i never actually did a coding test so mm. I've just been asked questions where it's what's a closure or um, you know, can you explain what TypeScript is? You know, those kinds of just getting your general level. I've also had take home tests. So I've had a, the best one, the best take home test I had was for my previous role, which was very, very relevant to the type of work I did. I basically got set a challenge, mm. which was here's five API endpoints set up 
uh, a JavaScript script that will go and get this information, this information, mm. transform it into this and produce this data at the end. And what I really liked about that is it's very, mm. very relevant to what web developers do day in, day yeah. out, which is basically exactly. make API calls, transform it and display it somewhere. Where Exactly. Whereas another coding test that I had was to make a date formatter. So basically, mm. I had to recreate the subtract and add functionality of moment.js with a specific syntax. So it would be like plus one D for day, plus four hours, plus six minutes. And I had to take that and then work out what that time would be from where you are mm. now. Or likewise, get given a date, and you had to calculate where what that string would be for mm. that offset, which is fine, but that's not realistic for the real world because that's a solved problem. You would never solve that problem by writing the code yourself. You would just use one of the existing libraries that already does it. And also, dates are are dates and time zones are like the hardest things a programmer can deal with. To have that as a coding interview test, it, it, I think is a bit ridiculous and mm -hmm. sort of, I think, shows what that company uh, possibly would have been like. So, so yeah, I, 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 it, is, it is more than possible to get programmer jobs without having to do technical tests, certainly mm. without having to do the horrible code on a whiteboard test. I've, I've never had to do one of those. Um, you just have to find the employers that aren't inundated with applications. The ones that have lots and lots and lots of applications, like the Facebooks, Netflixes, you know, Ubers mm. of the world, they they have to set the bar incredibly high as some way of filtering people out. How else can they do it? Whereas the companies that struggle to hire developers because they're an e-commerce retailer or they're a they're a, a courier or what have you. They are much more bothered about hiring for the individual than they are your raw technical talent because, let's face it, tech changes every three or four years. So you're learning on the job all the time anyway. Exactly. So, yeah, you, you don't have to. And, in fact, I say to people, if, you're gonna ha if, you're, if you are not confident doing a coding test, even if you're a brilliant programmer, you can totally fall on your face in a coding test because it's hard and it's stressful. If you're not confident, just decline it and find another company that's not going to put you through that. There are such mm. high demand for developers right now, such high demand for developers. There are many, many, many companies who won't put you through the trauma mm. of a coding test if you don't want them to. You, know, you, can be, you can be selective. And also, those companies are more likely to understand as a career switcher the unique things that you bring to the, to the role. Uh, that is beautiful. So basically, you have the skill set to land a job. Uh, so you pass all the prerequisite uh, requirement to actually land a developer job. So uh, can, back, can we back to the square one? How did you hone your online portfolio and LinkedIn? Can you share with us the details? Because the core reason why I reach out to you is I believe that uh, Job hunting uh, for a developer job uh, is a skill set. So it is way much different than the actual coding skill set. So can you share with us the details? How did you hone your online portfolio and LinkedIn? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think you're right. Being able to get a developer job is a skill set in its own right. Mm. If you are going to have to go through the hoops that big tech put up, Solving leak, leak code problems, that kind of thing. That's a skill set in its own right. As a career switcher, showing that you can do the job by demonstrating that with real projects is far more important. So your LinkedIn needs to highlight that you can do the job. And therefore, your projects need to highlight that you can do the job and be reflective of the type of work you want to do. So... If you want to be an iOS developer, mm. your portfolio projects must be iOS apps written in Swift. 
if that's sense. what you want to do. If you want to be a React Native developer and deploy to both Android and iOS, your portfolio projects need to be React Native projects mm. with apps in both Android and iOS. As somebody that has developed cross-platform apps for both, one or the other is easy to get right. <laughs> Then the other one's going to be a total pain. So I, as an iPhone user, I fall into the trap of making sure it works really well on iPhone. And at the end, I go, oh, okay, fine. I'll open up Android Studio. And guess what? I've got errors for days. So showing that you can do that is really important. If you want to be a web developer, have a web, have a couple of web apps up, ideally in the technologies of the day, although I hadn't written a line of React or Angular until I went into my first job. I'd only done jQuery, JavaScript, and PHP, and a bit of Node. So mm. that isn't isn't super important. However, it does help if you can say, yeah, I did this in, in React. Um, I don't think it needs to be, you don't need to set up DevOps and all of that kind of stuff unless you want to be a DevOps person. So if you want to be a DevOps engineer and you want to mm. do that infrastructure as code and that kind of thing, then maybe take an open source app Mm. and then build your own deployment pipelines and have that as your portfolio project. You say, look, I took this open source web app that you can just grab a copy of, WordPress, for example, or whatever, and I built this CI, CD delivery pipeline. You're not trying to do anything unique or innovative. You're just trying to show that you can do it yourself. So a to-do list app is an excellent portfolio project. Yes, a million people have done a to-do list app. Mm -hmm. But the point isn't showing that you can make amazing, unique, uh, innovative applications. It's showing that you can make applications <laughs> because ultimately when you're in the job, you're going to be making what they want you to make. You're not going to be making what you want to make. It's You're going to get mm. told you're making this. So making mm. things is the most important thing. So your LinkedIn profile needs to have links to your projects. Your mm. summary on LinkedIn needs to explain that you are a self-taught career switching developer with X projects, X experience, whatever that is, whatever experience you have, it goes in that prof profile. Any work, that any of your previous jobs in your LinkedIn the things that you need to highlight in a couple of bullet points is yep. the skills that are relevant to being a software developer. So that is teamwork, that is communication skills, that is time management, possibly even client or customer work. Anything mm. that you can relate to the job of being a software developer. And let's face it, being a software developer is a team sport. So anything where you can show you've worked in a team is really important. Anything that's sort of unique, to the industry you want to get into, highlight that as well. On your portfolio side, I have a huge, very strong opinion that no developer should make their own portfolio site from scratch. Don't do it. No one cares. Don't <laughs> make it in Next.js or a ne uh, Next.js with Tailwind or whatever. No one cares because Squarespace is so good. Webflow is so good. Card.io is so good, right? The bar has been set so high now for mm. how good a website needs to look that your portfolio site is not your selling point. The things you put in your portfolio site, that is your selling point. How you can demonstrate that you can make a Postgres database and a node mm. back end and a React front end to make a to-do list app or a weather application that mm. is your unique selling point not your ability to make a nice looking portfolio site because guess what that portfolio site is going to take 10 times longer than you think it's going to take and it mm. won't have the same level of polish and look and feel as mm. a squarespace site or a wix site or any of those a mm. painter does not make their own frame a developer mm should not make their own portfolio website. And I know there are people right now screaming at me, saying, no, I'm a front-end developer and people love my website. That's great, well done, I'm sure they do, but they would also have really liked another portfolio project showing how you made a great integration with the Pokemon API or the F1 data API mm. or another wrapper on the IMDB database. That mm. shows more technical ability 
problem solving ability and business logic understanding than making a nice look and by all means make the uis in those projects look really good if you want all of the most amazing animations and transforms and use tailwind and whatever you want to do do it in those projects your portfolio site either needs to be the quickest whatever you can or squarespace now my portfolio site is custom it took me two hours to make it it is a series of php include scripts statements and bootstrap that's what it is it's like it's an in, it's an index.html that loops mm. through a blog directory to load those and loops through a projects directory to load those and loads them yeah. in bootstrap it looks fine i guess but it doesn't i didn't spend hours on it and if i were to redo it now if I was coming in now with what I know, the first thing I would have done was made my portfolio site on one of the turnkey platforms, do it in a day, and then get back to coding real applications because that's what you're going to get hired to do. Oh, well, oh, very beautiful. So basically, it's like uh, reverse engineering the job requirement of that particular job Either is a backend uh, uh, web backend programmer or front end programmer, and then uh, you build a portfolio uh, around it and uh, shed light on that portfolio, and then to demonstrate you have that technical capability to actually deliver something uh, that fulfill that job requirement. So, uh, it is your particular process how you uh, actually uh, interview for e uh, 11 inter uh, jobs and then you'll have 10 over ultimately. Can you let's go into the promise of your book? Because the, the promise of the book is uh, so, uh, career switch to coding. Uh, this book, the promise of the book is to become a developer without a computer science background, and it shares a proven process. Can you give us an overview of that process? Yeah, so that process starts with exploration. Sorry, foundation, starts with foundation. Very quick section on, do you have the technical skills to do the job? And it's just loaded, it's loaded checklists based on different roles you would want to be and some very high level skills that you might need. I actually shared the full stack one on dev.2 a couple of days ago and had something like 20,000 views and yeah. 500 hearts or whatever and lots of comments people are very opinionated on whether they think it's right or not uh, lots of people do some people think it's not so that's fine so foundation very quick checklist i am not here to teach you to code There's so many places you can do that mm -hmm. the next one is exploration yep exploration is finding out if you have got it's finding the places that you can go, the people you can speak to that matches with your unique background and your skill set. Yeah. There's also setting out your stall, actually creating your online presence. So actually making that um, LinkedIn profile, the GitHub, should you be on Twitter or uh, Instagram? What kind of portfolio projects do you actually want to make how do you choose those then we go to conversation conversation is moving on from exploration and f speaking to the people that you found taking the knowledge that you've gained from looking at some job descriptions understanding job descriptions which i go into as well and what what a good one is and what a bad one is and what that might mean for what the job will be like and actually having a conversation with those people you're just reaching out you're just saying hey this is me. This is what I do. And am I am I ready for a career in technology? And you don't apply. You just find people who you know, recruiters is, is a great one uh, mm -hmm. or, or people that you, you maybe you know through uh, your network that hire are hiring developers, old clients and companies that you've worked with. Are they hiring developers? Just have conversations. Don't actually apply yet. Just talk to them, tell you what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Then we come to the actual application process how what's the best way for you to get your application in don't use things like linkedin easy apply because linkedin mm. easy apply 
you get garners so many applications the first thing a company does is get rid of 50 percent of them because if they if they can find somebody in 200 applications they can probably find someone in 100 applications and they just bin off half of them so you don't even get looked at and you've already mm. you've got a one in two chance of just getting binned off straight away and then when they do have you you don't your unique skills your unique offerings are there so we mm. i talk about how to avoid those kinds of things the best way to get your application in I offer some scripts, uh, some telephone scenarios and emails on uh, different ways that you can actually form that application. And then we talk about the actual process of execution, I call it, which is, okay, you've got your application in and they're interested. They're on the mm. hook. They've called you in. What does that process look like? The different stages you might come across in that process. How to act, behave, and prepare for each of those processes. So is this a life story interview? Well, if it is a life story interview, these are the kinds of things you want to be talking about. These are the kinds of questions you want to be asking afterwards. Mm. If it's a technical test, okay, I encourage you to avoid technical tests just because of the type of companies that tend to do them. But if you are in a technical test, what's the best way to behave in a technical test? How do you fill time to give yourself the opportunity to think? If you are stuck on something, don't just clam up and go silent. You need to actually talk through the problem. Even ask your interviewer, hey, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit stuck right now. What, what, what could I, you know, where would you go with this next? Mm. And then the final stage is um, conversion. So conversion mm. is actually getting it across the line. Mm. So how do you negotiate, for example? How do you ask good questions back to them? How do yeah. you actually go from being in that process to that last step across the line? And how do you potentially reject a job application, but in a mm. way that still leaves the door open for the future? How do you accept, but also make sure you still get any concerns that you have um, raised? Because eventually you will get a job offer. You know, you might be like me. You might have applied to 200 jobs and it might not feel mm. like you are ever going to get a job. But honestly, eventually <laughs> you will get a job. And all of these things that feel like long distance concerns and worries, they're going to become very real questions that you have in the moment. And how do you, for example... Let's say you've sent your technical test in, your take-home test. You've you've emailed it back, and you haven't heard anything for three days. Mm. That's the worst position. We've all we've all been there, waiting for a reply, waiting. Mm. Should I email today? Should I call? I don't want to seem too pushy. Oh, but what if I'm not pushy enough? Have they forgotten about me? You mm. don't want to be in that cycle. And so I say, look, you know, wait three days. If you've not heard mm. anything in three days, send an email. If you mm. haven't heard anything four days later, by this point we've crossed a week. You send an is it over email and you say, yeah. you know, thanks very much. Is it over? Did I not get the job? Because you want to know, because even a no is a good piece of data. Okay, I wasn't right for that role. I now know that perhaps I was pitching too high or I didn't do very well with that particular type of coding assignment. So maybe you go off and you do go and do a couple of elite, elite skills challenges, um, mm. elite code challenges. Those are the kinds of things I talk about in the book is, is how to run that process, find the employers to which you are a developer unicorn because there are employers out there who will think you are the best thing since sliced bread to use an expression my grandma used to use. Um, that, that, and that, that's what I talk about in the book because mm. actually learning to code mm. is, is half the job. The other half is actually getting it across the line. So that's, that's why I wrote it because I don't want people to be in that position I was in, in the summer of 2019, mm where mm. i i didn't i didn't know where my next paycheck was coming from and i didn't have the energy to start my own business and it was it was pretty dark it was pretty it was pretty it was pretty unpleasant and i don't want people to be there because it it doesn't need to be the case it really doesn't it's yeah. not learning knowing how to apply for work getting a good online portfolio mm. makes it a repeatable process um and, and once you've set that up once you've built that foundation and you've made your first contacts it's funny Every six months, recruiters get back in touch with you. Even mm. the ones that just landed you the first job. Six months later, those same recruiters, <laughs> they're <laughs> ringing you back and saying, how's that, how's that job I got you going? Because after six months, a recruiter doesn't have to give any of the money back that they got mm. for finding you. Um, mm. So, so yeah, yeah that, that, and that's what I want to help people set up is that kind of constant inbound 
mm. LinkedIn messages, emails, phone calls, because that is when you know that you have skills that are in demand and you've set your stall out well. And when those inbound requests tail off, you know that it's time to refresh your online portfolio. So yeah, that's uh, that that's the book. That's what it's about. And that is my current passion is helping people um helping people get jobs ah, beautiful i just came to uh be too greedy about this episode i cannot reveal everything first of all for the listener just just go grab a copy of the book uh, career switch to golden because there are so uh, too many golden luckies you can get out from uh from the book that in terms of uh how to mm, go through the entire uh interview process because uh, as you just said uh half of it is uh you you are good at coding and the and the other half of it is to actually going through the whole hiring uh process so uh uh but uh i i want to ask you one question because you just mentioned something like uh, this book is more than just uh, teaching people how to career switch to coding. I want to dig deep into your mental space uh, because you you are coming from like a uh, dark space to a uh, space that's uh, trying to educate people how to do the same thing that you did. How does it feel like when you publish a book like this and then what is the purpose and yeah how do you feel about all that is it just a labor of love, a labor of love that you love coding so that is the reason why you you do a book like this uh yeah can you talk about that yeah so i started an instagram account in october of last year late september last year called all the code and i was posting coding it's called a carousels and educational slides uh, and, I, and I noticed I was getting a lot of kind of questions around actually, how do I get a job? And mm -hmm. so I switched the focus of the account to talk more about careers and developer careers and my opinions on being a developer, my opinions on things like Agile and Kubernetes and, and the pace of change and burnout and toxic work environments and all of that kind of thing. And, and the running theme has always been with that account is lots of inbound messages from people looking for a coding job who know how to code i mean i get a lot of people saying how can i learn to code i usually suggest they go to google um or cs50.net they're my they're my two <laughs> main ones but still a lot of people and and seeing people develop hearing mm. them go through the same sort of journeys that i um i went through is really yeah. rewarding and i'm really really happy that mm. two of the guys that I talk to the most on Instagram, mm. career switchers, have both in the last four weeks got their first jobs. They uh, have gone from doing something completely non-technical to mm. actually now being in a role. And I interviewed one of them for my podcast on Monday Just Gone. It's coming out mm. next week. He worked in restaurants. And now he is a developer. Uh, it's career switch to coding dot com mm. as well. So every mm. everything is either my social accounts are at all the code. So mm. same on Twitter, uh, same on Instagram, and then the podcast and the um, and the book is career switch to coding dot com. And it's really rewarding to help people transition through their career change. And I just know that what I know it's so hard. The, the 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 kind of the self doubt you have and the courage that it takes to make the move, particularly if you're leaving a job as well. Like, whew, if you've already if you're already in a job, you're getting paid every day to do a job that you know how to do, even if you don't like it that much. To actually leave a job is is really hard. I had the benefit that my job kind of left me, <laughs> so I I had to find something. Um, but you know that that that's brave as, as well for those those people. So um, mm. so so yeah, that that's why I decided to kind of make the account and make make write the book is to mm. help those people. And I just I just really enjoy talking to people as well. Really enjoy mm. it. I, I enjoy talking about software. I enjoy talking about development. I enjoy listening about development. I enjoy mm. getting other people into development. I just I just I just find it all a lot of fun and really mm. interesting. So. That's why I decided to write the book. 
Yeah, the, thank you for the community service because it is um, uh, it is unusual in the developer space because um, not many uh, developer I would say uh, that uh, to share this kind of skill set not in terms of technical skill but in terms of interviewing and job hunting skills. So uh, to talk about your book. Uh, there are multiple rushes and many uh, knowledge uh, we can gain from your book. But I believe that uh, the core component is to uh, have a uh, portfolio project. So one of the rushes uh, that you've mentioned that will, uh, this particular worship will determine which portfolio projects will give you the most band of your buck. Can you elaborate this bit? Yeah, so basically, a lot of people don't know what projects to make. They mm. have blank blank sheet of paper syndrome where they just don't know what to make. Mm. And the easiest way to work out what to make is to go through that worksheet. You know, I, I key you off with kind of three potential places in your life that you could draw inspiration from. We then go through a process of working out what smaller features could be off of those. Um, and then we rank them on complexity and a few other uh, attributes to come out at the end with a, a hit list of potential projects that would be appropriate for making as a portfolio project because they are small, they are functional, and they can be completed. So that's that's what that worksheet's all about, is, is helping you generate those ideas because actually coming up with ideas is an active process. People think you just get ideas randomly and that can happen. You know, in the shower, we've all had a good idea before, but mm -hmm. actually sitting down mm. and going through the process called ideation, the process mm. of coming up with ideas is an active and engaged process. And that's what that worksheet helps you do. It helps you um, go through that process in a methodical way to get ideas out the back of it. Uh, so mm. yeah, so that's what I, uh, that's what that one, that one was about. Got it. So uh, we have now uh, laid down the half of the uh, secret formula to how to land a different job. So let's go to the the other half. Uh, you still have to be good at coding, right? Because that's your job. So uh, can you share, uh, talk about a little bit about the baseline coding skill sets in your opinion? In one of the blog posts that in uh, career switch to coding, uh, it takes nine months for one person to learn coding from uh, from the ground up. Can you share with us the baseline coding knowledge a person should have after these nine months of practice? Yeah, so you should be able to make a small application that solves a single problem. And mm. if it is web, you should be able to have something running in the UI that is usable, that has login, ideally, that can save state. Then you need a backend API for that mm. as well. Uh, that can be serverless if you want. My preference is actually that you have it running in on a server. You don't have to have it dockerized and containerized. You can just FTP upload it if you want. And if it's Node, run it with P3. And if it's mm. PHP, which is also fine, just upload those files to, to a, a via FTP to a server, SFTP to a server. It needs to have some kind of database. You need to have a basic idea of SQL and how tables work and joins and that kind of thing. It needs to just be... a functional application and if it's ios native then it needs to use some ios apis it can't just be like a basic display a table view with information right. it has to have some level of interactivity it has to at least store data locally that the user can input and, and draw back it doesn't necessarily have to um, communicate with uh, any external apis i don't feel i think there's enough in an, an Android uh, framework uh, mm -hmm. and iOS frameworks that you can you can show using core data, for example, uh, Face ID, uh, any of the APIs those phones offer. But it needs to have some level of usefulness mm -hmm. it is what you're going for. And it's fine if you have to Google a lot of it. That's OK. Oh, crack. We all Google all the time as software developers. That's, that's what we do. Um, but what it shouldn't be is just a regurgitation of a tutorial that you've done. Mm. 
if mm. you are still at the point where you have to have your hand held to code and we all go through that phase if you still have to have your hand held to code then you're probably not there yet you need to be able to with the help of documentation and googling set up a new project get react running mm. set up some routes have some kind of interactions you want to be able to understand what you're making and not just copying somebody else's code and not really understanding what you're doing mm. um and that and that's the kind of that's an important um differentiation i think and and you want to be out you, you don't want to be stuck in what's called tutorial hell um yeah. either you want you want to be able to be kind of independent and the best way to do that is if you are stuck in tutorial hell take those mm. tutorials um yeah. and start to modify them um so that you get a sense for what independent coding is um is is like because otherwise if you're just copying um then you're not really flexing your own skills um mm. you are you are just kind of regurgitating somebody else's thought process and regurgitating somebody else's thought process is not um a how you code because then you can't apply that to real problems when you are coding on real problems you have to be coming up with the solutions and understanding them yourself so i guess the ultimate way of describing what standard you need to meet is mm -hmm. you need to be able to write code to solve simple problems mm. that's it and demonstrate the solutions to those simple problems in some kind of dedicated um web app or iOS, just, Android app. Got it. I love it. Uh, since we are running out of time for this session, to wrap up this episode, can you talk about the difference between coder versus developer versus software engineer? Because mm, uh, I've read uh, this blog post on your blog, and then uh, that's something that uh, always confused me when I just started out. Uh, so that, can you talk about it? Uh, to of course. This episode? Yeah. Absolutely. So so this is actually something that I have received criticism for is that I have this opinion and I've shared this opinion. A lot of seasoned developers will say, it doesn't matter, there's no difference. Fine. Once you're a seasoned developer, you can have that opinion. But when you are learning to code, they feel like big deals. They feel, you don't understand exactly. the difference. I, I remember, I tell this story every now and again. When I when I was first creating a website, which is actually kind of before I learned to code, I made a little website and I was like information was like a blog. I remember it took me to was this like 2007, six, seven, right? I remember spending two days trying to work out what the difference was between a blog and a website. There's no difference. <laughs> but it took me two days to work out that a blog was a managed website with a application to manage the content i thought that they were different things because no one online and i didn't have anyone to speak to in my life told me that there isn't a difference between a blog and a website other than a blog is a type of website it's a type of web application really that you're just seeing one view of i didn't i had no idea i, I didn't realize this so mm -hmm. the reason i wrote this post about coder first developer versus software engineer is to answer the questions that code newbies coding newbies have which is mm. what one what what should i be what do i study to be a developer because i don't want to be a coder or oh, i don't think i want to be an engineer i want to be a what, what so basically <laughs> a coder every every code every engineer is a developer and every mm. developer is a coder to me the differentiation is basically a software engineer and a software developer they're near on the same thing mm. it makes no difference they're the same thing they are both a derivative of coder. A coder to me is what I was for the first 10 years, was me on my own. I didn't need to worry about branching too much in Git and I didn't need to worry about merge conflicts because I wasn't working as a part of a team. I was an individual. I was a coder writing code to solve my problems. Yep. And developer, I believe, is somebody who's working as part of a team. So if somebody says, I want to learn how to be a software developer, I don't want to be a coder. Well, OK, great. But realize that actually they're two sides of the same coin. You're going to be a coder because you're going to write code for a living. But if you want to learn how to be a software developer, then do focus on the team aspects. 
do focus on the uptime and delivery aspects do focus on agile learning those things if what your focus is i just want to learn to code i've got this idea on my head and i don't care about anything else then cool that that's being a coder the, de the demarcations aren't super important i think ultimately at some point in your career you will be all of them at the same time and one of them as well they are different phases depending on how you're working and in fact when i'm working in my day job i consider myself i'm a chartered engineer so i consider myself an engineer i consider myself a software engineer but i'm a developer right that's my day job because i'm working with people and working in a team but when i'm working in the evening and i'm writing a little you know scripty to to do something in my own time I'm, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not really using Git all that much. Um, I'm certainly not worried about tests. Um, I'm not doing CI, CD pipelines. I'm not writing documentation. Like yeah, exactly. I'm not writing I'm not writing documentation, and I'm, I'm not moving Jira tickets along a board. So I'm a coder, right? I'm just <laughs> hacking away, doing my thing, and, you know, I, and I probably won't even encapsulate very much, and I won't divide my code up all that much, and mm. I'll have whopping great big functions that do 17 things when really we all know functions should only do one thing because it's code for me. I don't care. Mm. I'm just just doing my thing. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, to me, they're, they're, the, they're the different. God. Uh, so thank you so much about uh, talking about uh, mm, how to land a job as a first time developer. It's very educational for this session. And yeah, just thank you so much for, for being on our show. Uh, uh, to thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's been really nice to talk to you about this. And I've really enjoyed the questions you've asked. They're definitely at a slightly deeper level, which is which is really nice, really great. Got it. So, uh, yeah, for the listeners, just just go grab a copy of the book. Uh, Career switch to coding and learn how to land your first job as a developer. So, thank you, Simon, uh, for the audiences. And until next time. Thank you very much. See you later.